If you brought a Bible, open it up to three different passages. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. John 3, 16. We're going to read two verses there. We're going to look really quickly at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. And here's the good news. If you're in Hebrews chapter 10, you just have to go back to the left to Hebrews chapter 4. And that's where we're going to do the bulk of our study today. Uh, But let me start off in John 3, 16. We're in this series. Uh, It's really a, a, a series of studies. And we're in the first part of it called So Loved. Uh, if you didn't get one of the workbooks that are out there, they're absolutely free. Uh, most of the notes um, are in, uh, in the workbook. There's some other supporting scriptures and things, and we'll cover some things today that are not in the workbook. Uh, but that's just a guide for you, for those of you who'd like to take notes and maybe like to follow up later. Uh, if, you don't, <clears throat> if you're not really into hard copy stuff, you can download those from our website and, uh, and find them electronically. But let me start off where we, where we began in this little series. Uh, in John 3, 16, verse 17. Such a powerful introduction because really in John 3, 16 and 17, it gives the heartbeat of the entire gospel. At four, four steps, four components there that let you know everything you need to know in a very baseline fundamental about what God's heart is towards us and what he's trying to accomplish. And so Let's just read it in from the New King James. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the four components are right there. God so loved, number one, that he gave his Son, number two, and whoever believes, number three, will have or receive everlasting life. It's really that simple. But it's also that profound. And verse 17 says, For, or the reason he did that was because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Although lots and lots of people think that he did. Lots of Christians still believe that God's in this angry posture. That he's got furrowed brows and he's kind of examining everybody in a critical way. And boy, you better walk a straight line. And that's just not what the Bible teaches but that the world through him might be saved. And so last week, we talked about the fact that God's not mad. And, uh, and, and we, we did a great study last week, and you know, not comprehensive, of course, you can always talk more, but we laid a pretty good foundation. But in light of kind of current events and what we're going to be trudging through this coming month, uh, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit, because I don't want any of us to have a misunderstanding or an incomplete understanding And I sure don't want any of us to miss the relevance of what's happening in the world right now. This is not theory. This is not religious, you know, hypotheticals. We're we're privileged to be living in a time where we're actually watching the scriptures unfold. Like every day you can look at your headlines in the news. You can pay attention to what's going on in the culture. You're like, yep, we took in another verse. Yep, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit said would happen. And so I, I want to kind of pull something together. We're not going to take a long time uh, because we do want to get to today's study. But this is relevant to thicken up our understanding. So as we roll into what we're going to look at today, uh, we'll be able to get even more. So here's what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to read some excerpts from a White House, the White House briefing room. And this was a statement by our president And it was given on May the 31st, so it was last Tuesday, and you can go read the whole thing at uh, wh.gov or whitehouse.gov. And here's the title of it. It's a proclamation on, trying to look and see if there's any kids in here, a proclamation on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex pride month. We're going to say from now on LGBTQI+. That's the acronym for it. And here, here's some excerpts for it, okay? Now, I didn't take all of it because we didn't want to take the time, but I grabbed some of the main points that I think are relevant for this morning. Uh, and again, you can go read the whole thing if you want, but this is what it says. During LGBTQI plus Pride Month, we reflect on the progress that we've made as a nation in the fight for justice, inclusion, and equality. Today, the rights of the LGBTQI plus Americans are under relentless attack. Now, I'll let you interpret that for yourself. <clears throat> you can do your own research. Uh, but from my understanding and my research, when they're call- what they're calling an attack, I probably would call we're just holding a standard. And, but they see it as, that, as an assault. And so I'll just leave it at that, okay? 
It goes on and says, American, today, the rights of LGBTQI plus Americans are under relentless attack. An onslaught of dangerous anti-LGBTQI plus legislation has been introduced and passed in the states across the country, listen to this, targeting transgender children and their parents and interfering with their access to health care. I would have a different interpretation on that. My interpretation would be that these legislations are trying to preserve the rights of the parents to say, you don't get to teach our kids and move our kids in a direction with our involvement, and we really don't want that in the early elementary ages. That's all I can find. So if there's something else there, you're welcome to find it and point that out, but this is all I can find. It goes on and says, these unconscionable attacks have left countless LGBTQI plus families in fear and in pain. Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority invested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim June 2022 as, and he spells it out, but it's LGBTQI plus Pride Month. I call upon the people of the United States, and here's, here's what I want you to hear especially. I call upon the people of the United States, and he's going to list three things. Number one to recognize the achievements of the LGBTQI plus community. Number two, to celebrate the great diversity of the American people. And number three, to wave their flags of pride high. Now the challenge we have in our nation currently is with a cancel culture, it's really hard to know what people actually think about this. Right? And it gets even more complicated because so many people know somebody who's immersed in this particular movement uh, or who has been affected by it. And so you get emotions and you got relationships and some are complicated with family ties and it just makes it really, really challenging. But I, I do have to wonder if we could somehow neutralize all that and we could just understand what do people really think. I would love to understand that. But, but let me just kind of graduate What I want to know even more is how can the church, and I mean the big C, church across the United States, probably we could go global with this, how can the church be so confused? Or how can the church be so divided? Now listen carefully, especially when God has been so explicitly clear. And he really has. In fact, I want to read to you, uh, we're going to kind of skip a rock, I'm doing some excerpts. Uh, from Romans chapter 1, because in in a real sense, God answered our president, he answered our nation, and he's answering us almost 2,000 years ago. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church at Rome, and uh, this is the book of Romans chapter 1. I'll start in verse 18, and I'm just going to skip a rock for, again, for time Uh, But I'm not changing the context. You can go read the whole thing uh, and validate that for yourself. But it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. Now, here's where I want to clarify, because last week we did a lesson and said God's not mad. But Romans chapter 1 says he clearly is. And so how do you reconcile those? What, What does that actually mean? And what we we clarified last week is when we said God's not mad, we said, well, it's not that he overlooks sin, it's just that God, if I can say it this way again this week, God has a job. In fact, he's got several jobs. One of his jobs is the righteous judge over all of, of, uh, over the whole universe, over everything, past, present, and future. And so he's got a legal issue that has to be satisfied. Jesus satisfied that for him. And so God's, not anger is, it, God's anger is not being demonstrated in that way against people who are sinning. But this word, it says, but he does show his anger. It's a Greek word that means he pulls back the curtain so that we're not confused what pleases him and what doesn't. We're crystal clear on that. It's not like God just went neutral since Jesus died and salvation's available. Well, God just has no particular, you know, leanings either way. That's just not true. And God has pulled back the curtain for us to see very clearly and plainly how he feels about things. And so, but notice this, it says he shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people. But here's the qualifier, who suppress the truth. 
And the word suppress there literally means who actively work to hold something down, who actively work to pull something that's true back behind them so that you can't really see that, you see what they want you to see. And so God, God is not happy at all. God's angry with people, not just who are sinful and wicked, but he's angry with people who are actively suppressing the truth. And notice how they suppress it. It says they suppress it by their wickedness. So they're living, they're demonstrating, they're talking about, they're propagating uh, this, this other truth, this other, other narrative that they want you to see. And because of that, they're not just saying, look, here's what God said and here's what we say, you choose. They're trying to erase what God says, to overshadow what God says, to make what God says seem like it's an, a, antique, it's, you know, it's old-fashioned, it's too narrow. In fact, it's not just a, dis, a, a difference of opinion, it's actually attacking, it's hating. And I'm not, I'm not adding this, this is exactly what's going on in our country. And almost 2,000 years ago, Paul said, this is, this is how God feels about it. He goes on and he says about these people, he says, they know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. Verse 21 says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their mind became dark and confused. Listen to this. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And the word for utter fools there is the word morano. Guess where, what word we get from that? It's actually the truth. I don't know if you've ever read an article or been in a conversation with someone who's ignoring every science uh, from every one of, of, you know, of, of the fields of science, just ignoring all the stats, all the trends, all the data, but they are just screaming and preaching a narrative, and you're like, that doesn't even make sense. It's like, what? And yet, they're, they're just screaming it, and you're thinking, what, when did we not just, you know, at least have some logic? When did we not have some, for, okay, I'm pushing Christianity to the side. Let's just be honest. Let's just be logical. Let's just be rational. But in these kind of conversations, they're not. Verse 24, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. And as a result, they did vile things, degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. Even the women turned against natural ways to have sex and, in, uh, and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationship, women burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Listen to verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and he let them do uh, things that never should have been done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. So in other words, when you abandon God's truth, it's not like, well, you're just off in that one thing. When you abandon truth, it opens up the gate for all kinds of other evil things, all kind of other twisted perspectives to come in. That's why our world is getting so confusing. You, you can hardly even make sense of it. And it's not just, you know, well, but it's just in this topic. Well, no, it, it may be that topic right now, but think about it. That one bleeds into this one, which bleeds into that one, which bleeds into this one, and it becomes everything. It says their life became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. Had someone asked me one time, do you think that we're as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah? We're worse. Way worse. Way worse. Because we've had thousands of years to come up with new ways to violate and new ideas about how we just twist things. It says they come up with new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. That one almost sounds like it doesn't fit unless you understand the depth of the culture. What they're saying is they won't even receive instruction from the experience, from the traditions, from the tried and true methods and truths that were supposed to be passed on. They've completely cut that off. Nope, that's old school stuff. We have a new way of doing things. And it goes on and says they refuse, to, they refuse to understand. This is a willful ignorance. Break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. Now, let, here's, here's the final climaxing uh, conclusion. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. 
Can't even talk like that in our culture. But God, God's pretty freed up. In their heart, deep in their heart, they know better. They know different. He goes on, he says, yet they do them anyway. And listen to this, worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now listen, we're, we're, again, we're not living hypotheticals here. We're, we're looking at what the New Testament said. This is how God feels. This is what's going to be happening in the days just before Christ returns. And we're watching it unfold. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not embellishing. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, cast dispersions on him. I'm just reading a statement by our president who's doing exactly what the Bible says we're not supposed to do. Not only violating this thing, but he's encouraging others to do the same. I'm praying that all Americans would join into this. Whoa, 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 hold on for a second. Can we have a discussion about what God thinks about this? Can we have a discussion about what God says? Now, again, last week we talked about God's not mad. And again, I, I, I'm saying he doesn't overlook sin. He pulls back the curtain and says, let me tell you what I feel about this. Let me tell you how I think about this. But instead... As the righteous judge, Jesus came and provided an opportunity for anybody who wants to to join into a class action settlement that paid the price for any sin, any, any evil, any weakness, and gave them a justification so their record could be clean and they could step into the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus is doing. This is what God is doing right now. But it doesn't mean that he's still not the judge. And at some point... If, if, if and when, no, I shouldn't say if, when we all go to stand in front of the judge, and we will, whether that's individually when we leave the earth or when he comes back and everything in the earth is wrapped up, at some point we'll stand before the judge and listen, he will no longer be this kind-hearted, this tender-hearted, he will be the judge. You had your opportunity. And I still love you. But we're going to do what the Bible or we're going to do what, what justice, kingdom justice demands. And so this is really important that we understand this. Super important you understand. Because when we look at what's going on in the world, we don't hate these people. We're not angry at these people. In fact, we have the heart of God, man. Our heart breaks and we're tender towards them and we love them and we, we, you know, we, we want to help them. But we also have God's heart to say, you know, you know what I, I really get angry and upset about is when people just will not allow the truth to be out there. When people won't allow it, it just be spelled out and then allow people to make their choice, praying that they'll make the right choice, praying that even if they're tangled up in something, they'll come and fall on the mercy of God and let, let him help them and forgive them and restore them and untangle them. See, that's the gospel. God so loved the world. And he didn't come to condemn everybody. He came so the world could be saved, so people could get healed and rescued. It's a tangled mess. I'm not trying to marginalize it or just kind of wrap it up in a nice box. It's not. It's, it's a tangled mess. But I want you to know the gospel doesn't change. God's not mad at people, but he is angry at people that are actively trying to hide this and trying to promote and, and pull other people uh, out of the gospel's truth and, and understanding. So today we're going to go from God's not mad, we're going to go to God understands. And I want you to know this is an important truth, not only for us to keep a lens to view the world, but also to realize this is the lens in how God views you and I, those of us that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But when I say God understands, I don't mean, you know, well, you know, God know, understands. You know, you hear people say, God knows my heart. He does. He absolutely knows your heart. And so I don't want us to hear God understands, so sin is no big deal. So we don't have to, you know, to listen and we don't have to lean in and let the Holy Spirit help us to know how to grow up in him, nor do I mean that, you know, God is saying, well, yeah, God does understand you and if you really love me, you get your act together. Well, that's not what it means either. So we, we want to understand some things about what, what, how, how God feels. Where's his heart in all of this? And we're going to especially look at it towards believers. But remember, the theme scripture of the New Testament is God so loved the whole world. So that he, he leans in more when we're part of his family because it's family business now. But I want you to know God's love and God's tenderness is for the whole world, for everybody. And he wants everybody possible to receive, to step into what Jesus has purchased for them so they can be saved. You know, there, there's something that happens. There, there's an empathy. There's a sympathy that, that can be released uh, much more readily when you've gone through something. 
And when you've gone through it, and you know what that feels like. And you know, man, I, I, I remember, you know, when I was there. And when you understand that from the inside to the outside, well, boy, your, your heart is much more tender, much more sensitive to when you see other people that have gone through it or are going through it. Now, let me give you just a couple of examples from my own life. Uh, I grew up in a very blue-collar home. Uh, finances were always tight. My mom and dad worked really hard, but finances were always tight. And because of that, uh, I had a real sensitivity towards people's finances and towards people, you know, trying to work through budget stuff. And, and I'm constantly sensitive and thinking about that. I also grew up and I was a chunky little kid. My mom always said I was husky because she didn't want to use any other words, right? But, but I was a chunky little kid. And, uh, and not only that, but I had a, a, a bronchitis issue. And so at the time, they were giving this medication called tetracycline, and it did wonders for bronchitis, but what they didn't realize at the time was it stripped all the enamel off your teeth. And so here I was, a chunky little kid, and uh, with, you know, kind of discolored teeth, and it made me growing up in school, uh, I, was, I was fairly insecure about my appearance. I mean, I was really sensitive and really conscious of that. Definitely, you know, wasn't one of the cool kids. Definitely wasn't one of those, you know, one of those kids that, you know, that was always pushing to the front. I'm, I'm content to kind of hang back and, and just see what I have to do and, you know, and those kind of things. And, and so that made me really sensitive to people that are, are prone to be on the outside. People don't feel like they're in the in crowd. People feel like they're kind of struggling to figure out how, to, how do they fit in. Not only that, but, uh, uh, you know, my family, I, I, I grew up in the perfect family for me. But my mom and dad uh, were fairly unrefined people. So they were passionate. They were hard workers. But my dad was, you know, a mechanic by train. He had, he had calluses on his hands. He could pretty much do anything. Uh, but he would just kind of cut through the chase and, you know, he, he's got this, uh, this working man's approach to life and not a lot of room for fluff, not a lot of room for, you know, explanation and dancing around. It's just straight to the chase. And when you're out in public, that's not always the best way to, to approach things. And so I remember constantly, you know, on one hand, being super proud that my dad, you know, didn't, wasn't afraid to step forward. And then as soon as he did, thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he just said that and just did that because it was way overkill a lot of times. And uh, not only that, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. And uh, I, when I say Pentecostal, I, I don't have any stones to throw at the spirit-filled uh, approach. In fact, we're a spirit-filled church. We, we have a Pentecostal doctrine here. But the church I went in, uh, that I grew up in was, was what I would consider to be Pentecostal imbalance or Pentecostal maybe incomplete because we had super lively services. I mean, you guys would either be entertained or freaked out if you'd go into some of the services I grew up in, right? Nothing shocks me anymore. However, it, it's not like that was a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But, but then afterwards, even me growing up, I couldn't see the principles. I couldn't see the character that was going on. In fact, I would look at other people who I knew were part of Reformed churches who didn't even believe in the activity of the Holy Spirit. And yet, man, they had quality lives. They had great marriages. They were doing really well in their finances, and they were super, you know, uh, disciplined and had great rhythms, and I felt like we were just rolling chaos all the time, but we had the Holy Spirit, so somehow, you know, we had the edge, and it was better. Anyway, all, all that to say, I, I just grew up seeing a lot of people that were hurting, and, and I noticed it, and I, I could see a lot of people that felt marginalized, a lot of people that felt insecure, and it forms patterns in your life if you're not careful. You grow up with a certain perspective. When, when I, I don't know why, but when I was in the ninth grade, between the summer of the ninth and the tenth grade, man, I grew tall and just slimmed out. And I'd always been in athletics. I was a fairly athletic guy. And so I went back to school in the tenth grade, and everybody was treating me like I was part of the in crowd now. Everybody was treating me like I'm one of the cool guys, right? And I'm doing really well in athletics now, and I can run, run fast, and, and I can, you know, jump high, and I could, I could handle a ball, with whichever sport it was in, and, and I did pretty well. I lettered in three sports, and, and I was kind of one of the most popular guys on campus, except for on the inside, I was still this chubby little kid with discolored teeth, because it forms mindsets in you. And you live in these prisons, right? And everybody has this opinion of you, except for you have a different opinion of you. And that just comes from people being hurt and people feeling insecure and people feeling guilty. But I want you to know, again, listen to me, that's all included in the fact that God so loved the world 
that he sent Jesus. Not just to forgive our sins and give us an eternal place to live. Of course, that's the highest priority because that's where we're going to be the longest. That's eternity. But part of God's salvation package is to rescue us here. Is to help us to be who he wants us to be here. To not feel insecure and not be imprisoned by past abuses or disappointments or resentments or anger and none of that stuff's supposed to hang on in fact Jesus came and said I came to heal the brokenhearted I came to open people that are in prison limiting themselves just just don't seem to enjoy life you know if you ever have those thoughts and you're watching other people have a good time and something deep inside says I wish I could be like that Jesus wants us to he wants us to enjoy and, and to experience life to the fullest potential. That's the reason he came. And this is what Jesus came to bring. And there's a promised progressive healing and growth and maturity that comes to those that accept the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I ask you to look at Hebrews 10, 14. This would be a great time for us to grab that scripture and, and kind of help us to understand what this means. Because last week I told you salvation is a legal issue first. You, you had penalties against you. Not just Adam messed up and we all get to suffer, but if we're being honest, not even deeply vulnerable on us, but just a little bit, it's not like any of us, you know, stupid Adam, because we've, we've, we've lived perfectly. If it wasn't for him, every single one of us have out Adam over and over again. We've made wrong choices and we made them knowing they were the wrong choice, but we made them anyway. Because we were frustrated, we, our emotions, our, you know, our cravings, whatever it is, we've made wrong choices in the courts of heaven. We have violated God's law. And we needed forgiveness. And so listen to what Hebrews 10, 14 says. It says, for by one sacrifice, that was Jesus, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You really have to understand both sides of that equation. When we accepted Jesus as our Savior, we became part of this class action settlement where Jesus took care of the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. This is why it's so tragic that people will go to hell because their redemption's already paid for. They've already got a ticket. They've already got the, you know, the class action out clause that will let them step out of that guilt and move into a place now where God will begin to mature and grow their life as a heavenly father would his children. And so I want you to know that it is a legal issue first. By one sacrifice, Jesus took care of the legal issue and he perfected it. He sealed it. He closed it off for you and I forever. We don't have to go back and take care of the legal issue ever again. Once you accept Jesus, you're in. You're forgiven. But I want you to notice that starts a brand new journey. Once you accept Jesus, now it's a family matter and the Bible says now he will begin to progressively help you to become everything that he's called you to be. So we've still got weaknesses, we've still got times we miss it, we've still got sin, but when we come to him when we confess, then God comes and says, yep, you're, it's family business now, you're my son, you're my daughter, let me help you to grow up. But he doesn't throw you out of the kingdom, he doesn't turn his back on you, he doesn't move your chair to the back of the room, he doesn't do any of that stuff. It, it's, it's, it's a legal issue, then it's a relational issue. And, and Hebrews 10, 14 helps us to understand that. Well, today, then we, we want to look a little more about that relational issue. And what does this mean now, and how does God approach this? Because, again, a lot of Christians kind of base what they think God feels about them and how they think God sees them and how they believe God will respond to them based on how their behavior is at the time. So if I've had a pretty good week, this is probably a good time to ask God for something because, you know, I've been a pretty good little boy, pretty good little girl, and, and maybe he'll be fine with it. But if I've not had a good week, oh, this is not a good week. Don't ask him about anything this week. And maybe we learn that from growing up with our parents or we learn that in this merit-driven society where if you can put enough gold stars on the board, then you get a little special thing. But I want you to understand it's very different in the kingdom of God. And we're going to look at three verses in Hebrews chapter 4. We'll be here for the rest of the time. And then we're going to see, we're going to do a study first so you really understand the scriptures. And then we're going to get to the truths. And once we get to the truths, it'll just be click, click, click. Because they'll almost speak for themselves. So look at, we're in the study. We're in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Notice this. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now let me just stop. 
This first two words are super important, seeing then, because in the Greek language, it means once you recognize something, once you realize something is true, once you embrace it as part, a valuable part of the equation, then it releases something else. It, it's called a conjunctional statement. And so this is a hinge right here. If you don't see this, then whatever comes next won't make sense to you. You won't be able to embrace it. But if you can see this, then everything else, like you're hooking up box cards, box cars in a train station, everything else you can take with you on the journey, and it becomes valuable. So he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for or because we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Again, if you can understand these simple principles that are the next few verses, then it forms a hinge in your life and you get to take a whole different perspective and a whole different mindset into your relationship with God. If you don't see it, you won't. But if you can see this and accept it as true, then here we go. We're, we're, we're moving on in a relationship with God with a different mindset. And here's the big question. But can God really relate to you and I when we're struggling in our weaknesses? When we're trying to struggling through life? We know we're not on our game. And we want to be on our game, but we can't seem to get back on our game. And we know we're just kind of struggling through this. Can God really relate to that? And the answer is absolutely yes. But most people don't understand this. Most Christians don't really believe this. And by the way, it's one of the primary reasons why you will often feel disconnected or you'll often feel in some way rejected by God. Maybe not eternally because you know you're saved, but in terms of how he's going to interact and help you in any situation or how, how he's going to fellowship with you in your everyday life. Let's go back to verse 14. Let's, let's pull a few things out. Again, it says, seeing then, that's that conjunction. You got to see this, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. So the role of the high priest is kind of an Old Testament role. And the high priest was there for one reason. He was the middleman. We would call it a mediator. And so you have God on one side and you have the people on the other and the high priest would step in the middle and the high priest would take the sacrifices and the offering and the needs from the people to God and then he would bring, take the blessings from God and bring them back to the people. Now that was important because at that point sin had separated man and God and we needed a savior to come and rejoin that. And now that we have a Savior who's in, who is in the heaven, he has rejoined that. We can come straight to God. You'll see that at the end of the study today. However, he has just moved his high priesthood. We think that Jesus did everything he's going to do, and he's no longer involved, but that's not true. Jesus now is in the courts of heaven, and Jesus is still that mediator. And Jesus still comes and he sees what's going on in our life and he goes to the great judge and he said, hey, I just want to talk to you about, about Pastor Gill here because he's got some things he's working through. He hasn't got all the way through them, but I just want to remind you, remind the courts that he's part of a class action settlement. This has all been paid for. And the judge of the earth said, yep, I remember that. Not guilty. Go ahead and release the blessings to him. And he comes back to me and says, okay, we're, we're releasing grace. We're releasing mercy, we're releasing blessing. And by the way, we always will because this class action suit covers everything, past, present, and future. So Jesus still is in this mediation position. And for you and I to realize, you actually have somebody who's advocating for you in heaven right now. I mean, actively. It's almost like you've got him on a retainer. And he's watching your life. And anything that, that gets a little bit off, Jesus is the one going to the court and he's saying, yeah, I'm here today to represent Pastor Gill. Got a couple things that he brought to me, and I just want to make sure they're cleared with the court. And again, he's part of a clash action settlement, and the Heavenly Father's like, yep, not guilty. Keep that next. And Jesus, this is what he's doing. We're going to see this over and over again. But it's really, really important because when Jesus stepped into this role, this, this became a role forever and ever. He'll never stop doing this. 
And because he's in this role, that's why the Bible says, because once we see and understand, I've got somebody advocating for me in heaven. Now, he's not up there saying, well, you know, but you know, Pastor Gil, he's got a lot on his shoulders. And it's not about that. It's a legal issue. I know that he did this, but he's confessed and asked for forgiveness. And I want want to remind the courts, this is part of this class action settlement. So there's plenty for there to cover that. And again, the righteous judge says, yep, he's clean. He's justified. And uh, next, but I want you to notice when you see that, when you understand that, notice what it says next. It says, let us hold fast our confession. And the word hold fast means to grab something tight and to hold it and refuse to budge, refuse to let it go. And notice what it says to hold on to is the word confession. And this is the Greek word homologia. And it means literally to say the same thing as somebody else. But wait, it doesn't just mean to repeat the same words. It means to climb inside of their thought process, to understand the passion and the resolve in which they said this, to recognize the rationale and the logic and how systematically it unfold, and to wrap your thoughts and your emotions and your mind around that, and then to come and say the same thing that this person's saying, only say it with the same passion, with the same conviction, with with the same resolve. And, And in other words, their words become my words now. I'm not just, well, that's, that's just what he said. No, this is what I'm saying now. But I'm saying it because that's what he said. And listen, it says, when you realize that you have an advocate that is forever, uh, forever representing you and your case to the high courts of heaven, it says, listen, you can then grab what that advocate said. Grab what the Bible says about you. It's a legal promise and you can hold on to it and never let it go. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how you behaved. It doesn't matter if you did it again for the 4,738th time. If the class action settlement covered it and the Bible says Jesus cleanses it, then you can hold fast to that confession even though your own conscience and your own feelings and maybe others are saying, well, you're not even living that out. I know, but I'm trying. I know, but I'm trying. And as far as the courts of heaven, as far as Jesus said, I'm clean. I'm justified before him. I stand righteous before before God. How can you say that? You know, you you still got sin you're, you're wrestling with. I know, but I'm wrestling with it. And by one sacrifice, he perfected me forever. He settled the issue in the courts of heaven so that now he can deal with me as a son and he can help me to get through this and to get on the other side of it. This is so important, but listen to me. You, unless you will stop and see it, unless you'll say, yep, okay, I can see that. Boy, I, I can recognize how that's connected together. You won't be able to take this with you in your Christian journey. You won't be able to live out this relationship because I'm telling you, your own emotions, your own heart will convict you. You, you, the enemy will make sure to pound you with accusation, some of them true, some of them false, but accusations nonetheless. You should have done this. You shouldn't have done that. Why did you think this? Even if you did the right thing, but you didn't really feel it as passionately as you should have, he'll pound you and pound you and pound you, and you need to be able to stand up and hold fast to what the Word of God says. No, no, no. I'm clean. I'm clean before the Lord. I've been justified before him. The blood of Jesus was more than enough. And the courts of heaven see me as justified. The courts of heaven see me as righteous before him. Even if I'm still cleaning myself up on the outside, on the inside, the courts of heaven say I'm righteous. And therefore, I'm entitled to receive the mercy and the grace and the blessings of the Lord because of what Jesus did, not because of what I did. Now, let's keep going. We're in verse number 15. It says, for, or this is only possible because we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. In case you're an English major or you even got a passing grade in English, that's a double negative. You're not supposed to talk like that or write like that, right? A double negative. And so what it really means when it says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, it means we do have a high priest who can and absolutely does sympathize. And this word sympathize in the Greek is exactly what what you might think it is. It almost sounds like like the same. Uh, But it really means to be touched and to be affected with the feelings that another's going through. And it really heightens and compounds when you can relate to it 
and therefore the compassion that you have just swells even greater and faster because you've been through something like that too and you know exactly what they're feeling. And the Bible says we have a high priest who knows exactly what you're feeling. We have a high priest who's walked through all this stuff and he knows everything, every bump, every bruise, every pressure point, every times where you're just exhausted, where you feel like you're swirling around the bowl and you just can't seem to get up and out and you're just swirling. He, he understands that. And the Bible says because of that, his tenderness and his compassion and his empathy and his sympathy comes quick and it comes full, full blossom when it comes. This is the, the, the Lord that we're talking about. And, and, and some of you are thinking, yeah, wait, what, what, what? How can Jesus, who was the son of God, by the way, how can he relate to that kind of stuff that we're going through? I mean, maybe because, you know, he's, he was omniscient in, in his godhood, and maybe, he, you know, I can understand it from that point of view. But this, this particular verse is telling us, no, 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 he feels it. Now, this is real. He has emotions. He has feelings. So when he's standing there advocating for us as a mediator, he's not advocating just because that's his job. He's got a stack of files. You know, he's just going through them, kind of wrote one at a time. His whole heart's passion's in this. He's like, listen, I, I know what this feels like. I, I, I went through stuff like this. I know what this feels like. And I just want to remind you, he's covered under this class action suit. He, he's passionately moving in this because he understands. In fact, look at verse 15 again. It says the reason that he sympathizes with us is because he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, this is pretty important. It doesn't say he was in all sins tempted. So we can't just kind of line up our individual temptations one-to-one, -one, but in every category that mankind might be vulnerable, every category that mankind might, might you know, have to walk through these pressure points, yet Jesus didn't escape any category. So maybe his wasn't the exact same individual thing, but it was in the same category, and it created the same internal pressure and the same decision point. It says he was tempted. In fact, the word tempting, uh, tempted in, throughout the, the Bible has a couple of different meanings. The first one is uh, something that appeals to your flesh and that will, if left unchecked, provoke or, or uh, expose or provoke a weakness to reveal itself. So it's something that maybe, maybe somebody else is not tempted by that, but that's kind of your vice, or that's your little weakness. And when that temptation comes, all of a sudden something starts working on you, it's like, ah, and if, if you don't deal with that, eventually you'll yield and it, it, will, it will demonstrate that. But, it, but the other side of it means to test or to try to examine somebody's strength in order to determine if they're as reliable as they say they are. In fact, in the Septuagint, in, he in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 9, it, it, it points back to the, to the, the, uh, the Old Testament, and, and it says that the people of Israel uh, tempted God and proved him and saw his mighty works for 40 years. In other words, he said, we know what Moses said, and we know who you say you are, but they kept putting him to the test. They kept saying, we just want to see if you're as reliable as you say you are. We just want to see if you're as powerful as you say you are. We just want to see if you're as attentive, if, if you're as faithful as you say you are. And they tested him over and over and over again. And God passed every test with flying colors, by the way. And yet at the end of it, they still didn't trust him. They still didn't believe. They still struggled. It was like one test at a time just to try to get what, what he wanted. But listen to this again in Hebrews 14. It says, in all points he was tempted, yet without sin. And this is where we get to those three Bible truths. So we'll be pretty quick about this. But if you're following along your notes, here's the first one. I want you to know the reason that, uh, the reason that we know that God understands is because Jesus was tempted and tested. I know you have to let that sink in because that whole he was fully God but fully man, I mean, that, that's just something to wrap our head around. We don't quite understand the incarnation with, our, with our, our logical, rational mind. We can't really put all that together, but it was absolutely the truth. And if we understand that he was both fully God but fully man, then when Jesus walked through these periods of testing and temptation, we can also understand on the humanity side of Jesus, he felt it just like you do. It was as hard for him as it is for you, and as hard for you as it was for him. This wasn't a walk in the park, well, I'm the son of God, so yeah, away with you. you know, I'm not going to do that, and it wasn't that. 
It was a genuine test, a genuine, uh, you know, uh, uh, lean on the inside. In fact, listen to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, if we lean one, one chapter forward, verse 8 and 9 says, Though he was a son, this is Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And that word suffering there is not the same word. It's not talking about the suffering on the cross. It's talking about for those 30 years that Jesus was growing up before he stepped into this ministry, and then even after he stepped into his ministry. But for those 30 years that Jesus was growing up, it, it's talking about something that comes from the outside and creates an internal pressure on the inside. It creates a decision point. And you're wrestling on the inside. Oh, I know I shouldn't, but, but I really want to. And, and, or I really don't want to, but I know I should. And it's a pressure point on the inside. And the Bible says that though Jesus was the Son of God, capital S, it says that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered, that internal, that internal pressure that we all wrestle when we're being tested or we're being tempted. Verse 9 says, And having been perfected or having been matured, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So listen, there's lots of other scriptures. You'll find some in your workbook that validate this. But the bottom line is, Jesus understands temptation. I mean, he understands it because he walked through it, not just because as the son of God, he's really smart. So it, it's easy to touch his heart. He's been through this before. Here's number two. Jesus understands and has compassion. Verse 415 goes on and says, we have this high priest who sympathizes with our weakness. And again, the word sympathy talks about because he can identify, because he's been through it, all of those emotions, all of that passion, all of that compassion comes to the forefront. And he's not just making a legal argument, although it's legal first, but he's also making a passionate plea and saying, man, I've been there. I, I know this is really tough. There's a number of scriptures in your workbook that are going to give you uh, some more insight and support about how God feels about this. But listen to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. It said, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. It means he's able to save for all of eternity. He's able to save in no matter what situation, no matter how big it is. Jesus is able to pull us out of this as, as our high priest. Uh, those who continue, uh, who, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Again, if I can kind of you know, use this little bit of a clumsy term, but Jesus has a job, more than one. But one of his jobs is he's your, your advocate. He's your attorney. He's the one who, who's in the court system of heaven all the time, all the time, passionately, but legal, legally, just solid in his standing, but passionately, both of those he brings with him, and he's constantly pleading your case to the Heavenly Father. I, I, I know they did it again. I, I get that there's, it's taken a long time. They're trying to work through this. But I just want to remind you, they're part of a class action suit. It's already been covered. And I just want to let you know, I'm working with them. I, I'm, I'm really, and of course, the Heavenly Father so loves us, right? And the legal issue is already taken care of. So, yep, righteous, justified. But see, we have to see that and we have to understand that or we will act like sinners we will think that the Heavenly Father is looking at us with this disappointment and this frustration, and he's not. He's looking at us with this hope and with this anticipation that the grace and the mercy of God is going to move us right through this, and we're going to become that person that he's created us to be, just like any great father would be. And so again, this says that this is an unchangeable thing. This will go on forever and ever and ever. Once we understand this, and listen, we, we begin to wrestle with temptation very differently. In fact, rather than running away from God, which most Christians do, we run to him. Even if you don't feel it, well, I just, I just, I, you know, I'm just too tired. I just don't even feel like praying. Then tell him that. You, you know that I want to be in a different place, but I'm spent. I'm exhausted emotionally. I'm just so piled on. It's like I feel like every day I'm just dragging through the day and, and I just need help. Then tell him that. But we run to him. In fact, that's what this last verse says. And here's point number three and then we'll validate it with the final verse. We can run boldly to God for help. We can run boldly to God for help. Look at verse number four, verse, uh, four chapter four, verse 16. Again, because you can see 
that he's your high priest. And because you can see that he, he lives forever, this is what he will do all through eternity. It will never change. You will always have an advocate. And because you can see that this advocate is not only in great legal standing, but this advocate also is very tenderhearted and is very sympathetic with every bump and bruise, everything it takes for us to live through this Christian life because he's been through every single bit of it personally. So there's nothing you can bring to him that says, I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of get it, but I can't relate. No, he can relate to every single little thing. And so with all of his heart, because of those things, notice verse 16 says, Now let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let me, let me just highlight a couple things that are so important. First of all, I want you to know he's inviting us boldly to the throne of what? Come on, one more time. What? Listen to me. Not judgment. Not correction, not scolding, not punishment, not rubbing your nose in it like, you, do you know how many times you come to me again? You expect me to do that again? You really, really, you want to have that conversation? None of those things. He invites you to come to the throne of grace. And notice what he wants you to come there for. He says, by the way, he says, I want you to come boldly. And this particular word, boldly, is so, so uh, vibrant in, in the original language. It means with freedom of speech. It means somebody that comes and speaks their mind with great confidence. They're just straightforward. They're not trying to dance around the issue and just kind of edge up onto it. They're just raw. Look, here's, the, here's, here's just the way it is. Here, here's where I'm at. And they're just pouring out their heart without any fear of judgment or criticism or not being accepted. They're just being raw and authentic and honest. He said, I want you to come boldly. And again, the word come there is a word that means I want you to draw near. I want you to know you can, you can open the doors and come flying right through the crowd and land right in the middle of my lap. On your worst day, he said, I want you to come boldly. And he said, I want you to draw near with no hesitation. And notice this. This is why he said, I want you to come so that you can obtain mercy. First thing you're going to get when you walk, walk through the doors is mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. You know you're guilty. You know you deserve for him to turn around and walk away. Or at least say, you know what? You sit in the corner for a while. But you're never going to get that when you come to God. First thing you're going to get is mercy. And by the way, in case you think, oh, I've used so much of it, his mercy endures forever. His mercy is brand new every morning. You, you cannot outuse God's mercy. Every morning when you get up, it's tip-top again like he's never given it before. And he's ready just for you to use all of it if you need it. He says to obtain mercy. And then he says, and to find grace to come and understand once you're mercy and you're clean and you're not going to get what you do deserve, then you turn around and you said, but I still need some help. He says, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to give you what you could never have deserved and never earned. And the whole Bible is full of promises that unfold the grace of God that you can never exhaust. But listen, because you've been justified in a class action settlement, you now have, have access to every one of those graces. All of that belongs to you by right, by inheritance by a settlement that Jesus purchased on the cross. And here's the last thing when he says, I want you to come and I want, you'll find mercy. First of all, this is what you'll discover. But he, oh, I'm sorry, he said, you're going to obtain mercy. This is what you're going to get. He, the word obtain is the Greek word lambano, and it means come and grab it. Don't come and just say, well, you know, I just kind of hope that you're going to stop that. Walk in boldly and say, listen, I'm not here because of me. I'm here because of what Jesus did. And it was so extravagant and it was so precious in the courts of heaven, so precious to the heavenly father. And he loves me so much. I'm here based 100% in the blood of Jesus and in, in, in what he gave to me. And Lord, I'm coming because I need mercy again. And he says, come get it. Just take it and grab hold of it and walk away. You know why that's so important? You understand that? Not that God's, you know, kind of like holding it and you got to snatch it from him because if you don't go and just take mercy, you will talk yourself out of it. Your emotions will tell you, come on, he doesn't really feel, yes, he does. I'm holding fast to what he said that he does. I don't feel like he does, but he said that he does, so I'm going to take what I feel and line it up to what he feels, because if he didn't feel that way, he wouldn't have said that, because if he said it and he didn't feel it, that would be a lie, that would be dishonest, that would be a lack of integrity. He doesn't lie, and so I'm going to take what he said as truth, and I'm going to obtain this mercy, and I'm going to walk away. 
and I'm going to have a day in victory with Christ, even though I just had the worst week of my life. He said, to obtain mercy and find grace, here, here's, the, here's the, uh, the cherry on the icing, I promise, for me at least. He said, in the time that you need help, here's how I translate it, in the times that I need it the most. See, a lot of Christians think that God will help them when they really don't need it. I'm doing pretty good, but I can go talk to God, have a great devotion, you know, because I had a great week, and Lord, just bless me this week. Well, you can do that. That's wonderful. What about on the day that you don't think you can get out of bed? What about on the day that you are so ashamed of yourself? That condemnation is trying to bury you. What about on those days? Yeah, those are exactly the days he's talking about. He says, yeah, on those days, you come running boldly into the throne of God. And you grab that mercy that's part of yours in a class action settlement. Nothing pleases the heart of God more than when we use and we honor the sacrifice that Jesus made. Why would it go to waste? That's exactly why he paid such a precious price. So on our worst day, when we're tempted to say, I, he probably doesn't want to talk to me, that's the exact day he wants to talk to you. You run to him because we have a God who understands and a God who will walk through every single thing with us. Stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. Then we're going to sing a song. And as you're singing today, I want you to make your altar where you stand just, just for a moment or two. We're just going to initiate a process. Take the things that the Lord has spoken to you today. Take some of the things you're struggling with and let's just respond to the Lord. Let's just in song open up our heart and respond to him. Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise of the forgiveness, of the grace, of the compassion, of the advocacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can walk away with a confidence today because you said this, because you promised this, and you live forever and ever to fulfill this for us. Holy Spirit, give us courage now. Give us brightness of mind and the ability to see it and to receive it and then to act on it now in Jesus' name, amen.